what I'm talking about. Wait. Okay, now, from the beginning. All right. Cool. Well, I think that's good. We'll get a start. So, how many people here are already familiar with the tools? A little bit. Quite a few, and you still came. Awesome. So, more knowledge. All right, I'm going to start with the, the little video we made recently, uh, actually just for internal use, but it was kind of a funny one that there's a quick intro to all the three tools that are now part of Unity, so I think they're, they're a good one. Everybody can hear me okay? It's come through all the way in the back? Awesome. All right. I shouldn't ask that. These guys have it all set up perfect. All right. You know I favor nice, cheesy techno music. I had to keep it for one more video before they could stop me. Some screenshots when we released. So per the left, you can now get Pro Builder directly from the package manager. Polybrush and ProGrids are on the asset store for now, and they'll be working their way over to the package manager. And a few examples of some super cool games made using the tools. A few of these you can find here in the booths and also uh, at GDC as well. Cool. OK, so as someone was mentioning in the crowd, uh, this is all totally free for everyone now. So you can get ProBuilder, you can get ProGrids and PolyBrush. Again, ProBuilder via the package manager is the best option. It's available uh, if you're using 2018 plus. It's, so it's a beta, but it's the best way all the uh, future features and fun stuff will be there. And then if you're just using 2017 or 5.6, you will only get critical bug fixes. So they're, they really want you guys to move forward, and 2018 is awesome, so you should do it. Uh, Polybrush and ProGrids, for now, are still just in the asset store. If you previously had purchased them, you'll notice they show deprecated, and you'll just need to get the new version from Unity. Uh, and that's it for a start. Um, I gave you a little bit of roadmap, I guess, actually, before we start talking about how to use the tools. Obviously, we're just working on improving a lot of things in ProBuilder. Polybrush will become package manager. ProGrids will get integrated, which is really exciting to me. Um, do we have any grid obsessive people in here? A few at least? OK. <laughs> For me, that's always been a big thing, having that grid. Uh, so that's going to be integrated into Unity. No more opening up an extra little menu and silly things like that. Um, so again, as I began uh, through the, the live demo here, I just want to let you know, again, yell out a question if you have it as I'm going. That helps. And this guy back here, Sean, has a microphone, which he can throw to you, or you can have passed. We got a first one here, all right? And then I'll, and then I'll get jumping in. Yep. Um, will these tools, or do they? I'm not too familiar with them. Uh, do they support staying in quads as long as possible? Yeah, of course. It's all up to you. Uh, as you work, if you build quads, they'll be quads. Nice. <laughs> uh, and you can always fix them further. So yeah, I'll go through some of that in here as well. Sweet. Thank uh, you. Yeah, you can work as you need. So a quick mention on that, as I start working here, ProBuilder, just to, to keep it in your mind, is just a mesh editor. It's not BSP, if you might be used to that from other engines and such. It's uh, just a totally normal mesh. As you'll see, I can build things like uh, dynamic character parts, doors, elevators, all that fun stuff. It's just a regular mesh. So I figured we had a bit of an um, exercise or practice at a previous uh, video or, or session that you might have attended that turned into an hour session instead of 10 minutes for me. So that worked out pretty well, actually. Now I have a pretty good plan here. Um, I'm going to just go through and show you guys how you can build something like this. So real simple prototyping demo. Uh, I've got a little weapon or item in the character's arm. We've got this sort of cave that you can walk into and, and go around. So I built this in about um, an hour, real quick, just, <laughs> just recently. I realized maybe I should have something to, to showcase. So again, very simple, but the idea is this is what you'll really want to try to use ProBuilder for, I think. You could do other things. but you can open up Unity, you have an idea in your head, and you don't want to have to bounce between other programs, or maybe if you're new to 3D, learn Blender, learn Max, et cetera, uh, yet, 
you can jump in, get your prototype moving. And if I'm, I'm working in this and I realize I, I don't know, I just need to change something real quick, there's no extra process. I can just start doing it, and there it is. Um, cool. So let's go ahead and, and rebuild this separately and try to do uh, as good or better a job. Let's see how much time we have and, and questions and such. Those are great. So I'll create a new scene. All right, so all my settings are, are, are reset. Hooray, we'll, we'll go into that. No worries. Uh, number one, when you're using ProBuilder to start, I'll just close this tab. Pretty easy tools, uh, ProBuilder, and open the ProBuilder window. So we've got two parts here, the main, the main tab. I'll try not to point at things you can't see. Use the mouse. So the main ProBuilder window is where you have all of the uh, complex tools, some shape tools, object stuff. You can ignore it for the most part when you're starting, and that's a little bit by the design. We want you to be able to jump into this and just start building. Uh, up here in the middle of your screen, you'll see the edit mode. So if, again, you're used to Max, Maya, anything like that, uh, you can, it's, it's pretty standard. You're moving through vertex, edge, and face. And then to start building something, I'll just hit Control-K, pretty quick and simple way I can spawn in a cube. So you can start from primitives. You can start from a simple object. You can start by drawing out shapes. But once you have something, you then start editing it, again, using the basic Unity tools. So I'm going to go to face mode here. And then when I click, I'm selecting a face. If I go back to object, I'm clicking, I'm selecting objects again. So object is kind of like standard Unity mode. I'm not doing anything special. I'm just doing it. Yep. Can you, um, can you dock the toolbar, the Pro Builder toolbar? Oh. Uh, so the question was, yeah. <laughs> yeah can, can, you, mm -hmm. uh, can you dock the Pro Builder toolbar so like it's, it's kind of on the side or something like that? Yep, yeah. Um, I'll go over a whole bunch of stuff with the toolbar. I guess I might as well now. Um, no, I lied. I will skip it, because uh, I don't want to have people worry about that just yet. Uh, I want to kind of showcase how it works without, with kind of ignoring this. So for people who are really new to, to Pro Builder, you don't get overwhelmed or anything, or new to 3D in general. So yes, that's a very good question. Sorry, I'll, I'll get back to it, I promise. Uh, OK, so, so the very basic stuff. Again, we're just you click to select, you can drag select. Uh, just like you would in Unity. You don't have to learn anything special. Click and move, and it's going to move and move that item around. Um, if you hold Shift while you're moving, it's going to do an extrusion. So now I have some extra parts and pieces, and you can, again, select multiple and keep going like this. So really quickly, you can start adding on extra geometry without having to use that toolbar, without having to learn anything special. Uh, you can also create some nice little insets and such this way, uh, maybe right about here. Switch into scale mode, so I'm scaling things down. You kind of think of it that way. And again, holding Shift, which is the extrude tool, do an inset. And then I could you know, pull that up or down, and I have you know, instantly start creating things. And all of this is being done, again, without using any kind of uh, extra special toolbar, just the Unity tools. You can rotate and extrude at the same time, but it just creates weird stuff. So we leave it there, <laughs> let you guys do it. But uh, it doesn't work so great. You know, for example, I, I can hold Shift and do this, and, and sure, it works, but uh, it's not super useful unless you have a, a reason in mind for that. <clears throat> cool. So you're building up. You have some shape, and you want to start getting more complex. Now, as promised, uh, I'll get over to the toolbar here. Uh, this is the main ProBuilder toolbar, like I was saying. We built it to try and give you um, all the complex options color-coded, keep it from, from, again, overwhelming you. If you right-click, you get a couple modes here. You can change it between text mode and icon mode or floating and dockable. So if I change it to, to a dockable, it already is, sorry, uh, I can drag and set it up like anything. And as you change the size, it's going to refit for you. Uh, this is something that was super important uh, to a lot of people because maybe you use it floating up in a horizontal toolbar. Maybe you need to fit it somewhere real specific that you just want it out of the way or something like that. Uh, this way, your workflow is a bit simpler, and you're using the screen space just right. So we thought that would be important. Uh, and again, switching over to the, the text mode. So if you really prefer to see exactly what the buttons are, it's a good way to start. If you're first using ProBuilder, keep it in text mode and just start working with it. As is popping up right away, we've also got some real nice uh, custom tooltips built in there. So if you hold Shift, it'll automatically show them. Otherwise, it'll take a second or two, or not at all if you've turned them off. So it'll show if it has a shortcut right there, Control-Shift-K is going to open it up. So another good way to start learning the tool is just kind of walk through and check out the tooltips. We've built in a lot of shortcuts, so you can get working really quickly. And you can also um, control or, or customize those as well. So we wanted to make sure that it works for you, depending on 
uh, your keyboard layout or, or what you're working with. Uh, so I'll show that real quick under Edit and then Preferences. Go down to Pro Builder. So there's a whole pile here. <laughs> Obviously, you don't want to go through all or even any of them necessarily, but you've got lots of shortcut settings and more. So it's a good thing to check out when you're first using the tool. Just get a quick look at what you maybe can edit. Don't worry about actually customizing it yourself. Of course, you'll just kind of uh, run into too much there. So just, just kind of know it's available. So we'll start building the, uh, the actual object, or that, that little scene I was talking about, just to go through a, a more realistic situation. Did you guys have any questions on just that real brief starter? It's a good, good chance to throw everything out you have right now. So when you make, oh, there we go. When you um, do the extrusion, will it, um, is there an option to have it create new objects in the hierarchy as you extrude? There is not, and you're probably thinking of, that other particular engine that does that with the BSP, at least that I'm aware of. <laughs> um, it doesn't, we've had a request for that. I'm not sure it really works for the way ProBuilder works. It's more of a mesh editing type tool. Yeah. Uh, but it's a neat thought, yeah. Uh, you can separate chunks. So if you just extrude and then grab those and hit separate to a different object, which we'll go through in, in, in this tutorial a bit later, I think. Um, yeah, so there's, there's other ways of doing it. Yep. OK, thank cool. you. Mm -hmm. Anything else before I get into building some more complex stuff? All right, cool. You guys know everything already. All right. So in that scene, I started out making a tunnel, and then there's an it, like a doorway and an interior space. So I'm going to start with creating a, a tunnel shape, and later on, we'll also get into polybrush a little bit, so you can see how we might paint that out to make a little rougher shape. Because obviously, ProBuilder is great at making blocky shapes, but we want to sometimes get a little bit more organic before exporting to OBJ or something or FBX and, and really working at it in an external tool. So I can start using Control-K with a simple cube. I could maybe do it a little simpler if I know the size of this tunnel. Uh, I use Control-Shift-K. And now I get the shape tool right here. So this I can set the dimensions or choose different shape types. It's great if you want to create something like an arch or a stairway uh, that you need to build but don't want to put all the little parts together. And then, of course, it's going to just do all these neat things on its own for you. Uh, we don't need a stairway. We need a, we need a tunnel. So I'm actually going to start with a cube in part because especially while prototyping uh, versus a cylinder for a tunnel, I find it really helps to keep things as simple as possible right away. If you start adding more polys quickly, the, the biggest problem we see on the forums, it would be usually people who start uh, adding tons of polys and things get really hard to work with. Uh, that's more of a general tip for 3D modeling than, than, than using ProBuilder. So maybe I won't tangent on those too much. Um, how many people here are actually already like experienced 3D modelers? OK. so. A little less than half. So I will tangent a few times for the rest of you. Uh, I think that, that might be useful. Cool. So I'm creating this cube. It's going to be my tunnel. I want it to be maybe about four meters high and four on each side. So I'm just going to quick set some values here so I don't have to do it on my own. And maybe it's going to be, I don't know, about 20 long. And I can hit build, and I have it. So of course, I could do that manually, but this makes it just slightly simpler. And I need a bit more detail on this. I want it to have uh, sort of it's higher at the top than the bottom, and maybe it curves a bit or something fun. So right away, I need a bit more, more geometry in here. And one way to do it, uh, <clears throat> that was a good one. Uh, one way to do this would be to hold Shift and, again, make those extrusions a few times. Um, but I already have the tube, uh, tube here, so I'm just going to select an edge and use a an, uh, loop insert. So down here in the menu, uh, the toolbar, I'll make this a bit larger so it's easier. Uh, I can use insert edge loop, and that's just going to toss in a brand new loop. So something you're you know, pretty familiar with if you've been using other 3D tools. Uh, just gives you a way to add some, some quick detail. You can also connect individual faces if you just use or edges by using the connect edges, and that gives you just one. So again, you're kind of conserving. You end up creating a weird polygon up there, which is another thing you should be warned of. But keep it simple. I think a lot of times this is easier than having tons and tons of loops. Uh, for this case, I'll just go ahead and do this. Um, Alt-U is that loop. So trying to throw in some keyboard shortcuts here so you guys don't have to watch me click on the toolbar over and over. Those are great to learn. And now I'll go in and start editing this. Um, I completely forgot to mention earlier, obviously, vertex and edge mode, once you click into those, you can edit those. And I'm going to start moving this around and make, uh, oops, a shape. OK, so I drag selected. And when I did, I missed this point over here on the bottom. I need to turn my select hidden on. So it's going to do that. Uh, good. As I do things wrong, you guys will learn before you do it. That's, that's good. I've reset all the preferences to, to default. So if, if I run into a problem, 
you might also. Uh, okay, so, you know, what are we going to have for this shape? Nothing too complex. Uh, something like this-ish. I'm just moving through and setting up something that might look all right. Cool. So I have a tunnel. It's facing the wrong way, and I have no entrance and exit. So I'm going to select a face on each side. And again, just like regular Unity work, holding shift will select multiple or control. And hit backspace to delete it, delete the faces. If you hit delete, you delete your entire object. So don't do that. But control Z works. So, so you're OK if you do. Uh, then it's still not facing the right way, obviously. So flip normals. And now it's inverted. We have this because a lot of times it's actually simpler to build things facing outward for whatever reason, at least for me and a lot of other people seem to agree when you're building something, it's just this is more easy to, to work with. Um, and then you flip it, and there you have it. Cool. So we have a pretty simple little section here. And now I'm going to build in the doorway entrance. Uh, once again, I could build this as a separate object. And that's perfectly fine. But I already have a perfectly good uh, entrance shape here. So I have all these nice edges over here. I might as well start by using those edges. And then I can detach to a separate object later on. So I'll hold on. Um, uh, sorry, hit R to switch to my scale mode, and then hold Shift, and I can extrude, and that's going to extrude the edge itself. So extruding edges is a really powerful way to, to add on geometry as well. You don't have to use it on just faces. Edges will give you a lot more that you can do with it. And then I can also, again, hold Shift, and then move that out, and I've started to build the, uh, the entrance way. And at this point, um, we can talk about ProGrids just a little bit. So I've been working with it on up here in the corner, and at a pretty, uh, actually a very small grid size, which was a bit of a mistake. When you start working, again, few polys, simple construction, and also use a large grid size if you can. And you can always get more organic later on. The grid size is just like drawing on grid paper. If you have a larger grid, you're going to just start simpler, not worry too much about tiny little details. You'll get a lot further a lot more quickly. Um, so if I set this, let's say I can uh, just hit the plus key, and you see that number bump up. It just doubles or halves using plus or minus. Or you can click on it to directly edit it in some other settings. And you can make it visual by turning the, the visual on button there, turn it on and off, all that. So if I move this up to a whole grid and then look at this from maybe the top view, nice ISO view, I notice that all these points I have are actually not on my grid. They're on the, they bump down the 0.25 meter grid, which is OK if I'm working with that. But I, I want to move it back to everything to be on the 1 meter just because I'm really obsessive about that, right? Uh, at least when I'm starting. So pretty simple. I'll just move into vertex mode, select all of these, and hit the push to grid button. Actually, let's change that first to one meter. What's going to happen is all the verts are going to be shoved onto the grid. No matter where they are, it'll pick the closest grid point to them, which sometimes can result in catastrophe. We'll see what happens here. OK, not bad. So as you can see, it jumped to the grid. And I don't really mind this because I've been just prototyping. It's real basic stuff. So of course, another good reason to not get detailed, first of all, you make mistakes like this. You want to be able to fix them and not worry about what happens. So now I'm on a one meter grid. And I know while I'm building, I can really easily snap stuff together. Oops. Let's keep this in a better view. Uh, also, let's, let's get this thing over as a dockable window and kind of out of the way. No need for that. OK, so I've got this shape. And I'm building out my entrance. Speaking of grids, this, this is right now about a two meter tall by two meter wide. That's, that's way too small for a doorway. Uh, I'm going to need to change this a bit. So I'll hit minus, go down to a 0.5 meter grid, and just move this down a bit, and maybe this one up. And you can see as I'm moving it, everything is, or the elements are snapping. It'll also work on objects in Unity. So anything that has a transform is going to be snapped to that grid, or if it's an, uh, an element. And one last item, I'll put the other side to this. Or actually, I'll leave it alone, and then we'll start building the, um, the actual base on the other side. So I was going to detach this and make it a separate object. And we'll see why in a little bit when I start working on the, uh, the actual making the tunnel into a nice organic shape. But we'll get there. So with those, those faces selected, we'll scroll down and find the detach. And you'll notice it has a little plus symbol next to it. So this means you have some extra options for it. And if you're in the icon mode, it'll have a gear icon above it. And you can hold Alt and click to open up the settings for it. In any of these settings panels, once you set it, it becomes a default. You don't have to keep doing this over and over. Uh, so you'll just kind of work through and find what works best for you. And you can always modify it later. Let me bring this back to text mode so it's more obvious what I'm doing. 
So I'll open that up just in case, and I've made sure it's detaching to a game object versus a submesh. Submesh is going to be, uh, well, we'll show it, make, make sense. So I'll detach that. And now if I move this around, it's still part of this object, but it's, uh, it's a separate chunk. So it's kind of just splitting all those verts and letting you move it around if you need to. Uh, so I don't actually want to do that. Let me just control Z a few times and get that back. Reselect, I went too far back. And I'm going to change it to a game object. I want to make this a totally separate item, detach it. And now when I have this, oops. All right. So this is another good learning situation. I detached it, but my pivot, uh, the pivot is still you know, way the heck back there. Uh, why is that? So we originally built this shape with its pivot here, and then we smushed all those grids to one meter grid, and we did a lot of ugly, ugly things. But the pivot remains in the same point no matter what, unless you actually move it, which is a good thing. Um, but of course, here, we want to move it now. I don't want the pivot for the door entrance to be way back over there. So you can either do an object action and just center the pivot to the object very quickly, or you can center it to a specific element or set of elements. In this case, uh, we can do either. So again, looking at this toolbar on the left, you might have noticed, again, we have this color coded. So the top, these orangish brown items are shape, or sorry, uh, tool panels. Below that, we have any sort of selection, toggles, and options. And green is going to be object tools. So I have an option on here that says, Center pivot, and if I click it, it's just going to center the pivot right away. If you're using Pro Grids, it's going to center the pivot and make sure that pivot is on the grid, so you're not going to have any weird inconsistencies with that. Uh, maybe I'm really picky, though, and I want that pivot to be right here at this vertex or right between exactly these two uh, vertices. I'll choose this one just because it makes more sense. So now once I move into any of the element modes, you'll see the toolbar gains these red options. So red just means geometry tools. And again, this toolbar is dynamically kind of changing while you're using it. It's only going to show items that are currently useful. So I'm here in object mode, no geometry tools. I don't need them. They're just going to get in the way and confuse me. I move to vertex mode. It's going to show anything that's currently available for that version, or sorry, the, the edit mode. So edge has different options than vertex and face, all that. Uh, also, if it's grayed out, it means you can't do it. So I have no vertices selected, so I can't do anything with that. Once I select this here, oh, there we go. Now I can go ahead and set the pivot to that vertex point. So when I hit Escape to go back to object mode, now I see my pivot is right there. So a couple options for that, um, just so you have it, super useful. And again, a good little thing to break there. That wasn't planned. Probably should have been planned because it was, it was good. Uh, now we want to create the, the rest of the, the little base area, I think. And that'll be the last step before we go through and do some polybrush work, I think. So I'll move into a top-down view. So I get this, this nice grid paper look again, and then bump back to a whole one meter grid, just to keep it real simple. I don't remember that this time. And we have the poly shape option. So by using this, I can click and just start placing points. So this might be the shape of this, uh, this item that I'm creating, or the, the base. And I'll just click around and create something pretty small. If you misplace one of your points, you can click and drag to move it, or just hit Control-Z and keep going, so it's pretty free form. You don't need to worry about it too much. And this looks, this looks pretty great, something like this. All right. Because I'm in ISO view, it's popped right in with zero height, because normally you use your mouse cursor to set that up and down. So you can go over here in the inspector and set it. Maybe I want this to be a five meter tall object. And we have it. And I'll go back into perspective, so that's a little more obvious. All right. So here's the shape I've made. And as a poly shape, I can continue to edit it. If you click on Edit Poly Shape, you'll get those points back. And now I can click any of these again and keep moving it. I can also click on a line anywhere and add another point to start making a bit more complex. And again, Control-Z will work just fine to undo if you need to. And you don't have to worry if you are creating something concave. It'll handle it just fine. Or if it doesn't, let us know. That's a bug. We, we want to know. Or I just managed to break it. Too many control Zs. All right, hold on. OK. There we go. Let's, let's go back. Any questions at this point, or I'll keep moving along? Yep. Uh, yeah, that's a weird shape polygon. Is there a way to you know, make it a better polygon? <laughs> oh. Yes. Yeah, oh. that's a weird shape polygon. 
Is there a way to clean it up? Yes, absolutely. That's one of the next things we'll get through here. So it's a good point. As I've created this, there's now a big nasty end gun on the top, right? It's perfectly flat, so you're not seeing any weird distortions, but we're going to see that soon if we try to do anything with it. So any experienced modelers might be screaming inside as they look at this. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll make it a lot prettier, I promise. Um, cool. So I think that's, that's pretty good for showing off how this works. Uh, one last thing, you can grab the, the green point and move this up and down. At any point, you can keep editing this. Once you start editing it as an actual mesh, you can't go back so much without undoing all your edits because we don't have real modifiers stacking yet. Oh, a question, sorry. Was that it? Yeah, no, I, <laughs> no it wasn't it. Uh, for somebody who doesn't have as much modeling experience, uh, could you just allude briefly to like, why it's important to align your geo to the grid size, like you did at the very like, five, mm -hmm. 10 minutes ago? Sure. Um, when you're keeping everything on the grid, it keeps you from making mistakes, I guess. If I'm looking at this here, I have it on a whole one meter grid, so I'm not, or it's harder for me to accidentally take a point and maybe move it past and through something or into it, which is going to create sort of impossible geometry situations and such. If I'm not using a grid, that can easily happen while I'm not thinking about it. It also means um, I'm just going to end up with odd angles and things. So when you're first building simple prototypes, You'll really want to keep to 90 degrees and 45 degrees if you can, or, or think of ratios like two over and three up or something. The reason being, uh, as you want to fit parts together, and I have, a, I think, a good demo for this later on, too, as I add in some stairway shapes, you, if you know the exact angle of something, you can put it together real nicely. Um, so keeping on that grid allows you to keep that angle. Um, yeah, does that kind of answer your question? It, yeah, it's not so much about making it an efficient mesh. It's just about keeping yourself out of trouble, kind of. Yep, right here. What would be uh, best practices if you were to be able to be outside and inside your tunnel? Because you flipped the normals. Mm -hmm. So what would you want to do if you wanted to see normals on both sides? OK. Um, the simple and dirty option would be to use a two-sided material. Not really a good way. Uh, I think other option would be to build sort of a shell around it. And a really simple way to do that might be just to duplicate your original object and then kind of scale it up using actually using the vertex points would be best. So I'll just scale this up a bit, something like that. Oops, wrong axis. And I want to flip that also. So now I've got a bit of an exterior on it, and then finesse that. Uh, then you could take these two shapes, merge them down to one, and you have a singular. Uh, so you just use the merge objects here. I won't use that right now, because we want to keep these separate for the moment, I think. Uh, you could merge or bridge those edges together, lots of things. Um, I'll try to do a little demo on that, maybe if we have time at the end, because that's a good question, of course. All right. Yep. Um, I didn't catch it if you did it yourself, but when you create a new game object and you do the um, the vert drawing that you just did, when you create that ga that game object through ProBuilder, does it automatically attach a mesh collider script or a mesh yep. collider object? Yeah, definitely. Um, so everything you build is just going to work automatically with any collision and such. Uh, then you can fine tune that as much as you want. It's just a regular mesh collider that's dropped onto it. You can change it to a box collider for more to be more efficient or something else like that. Uh, turn on off convex, et cetera. OK, mm -hmm. thank you. Yep. Yeah, actually, speaking of which, if I wanted to test this right now, I could just drag and drop in. Uh, I have the standard assets here somewhere. I could drop in the FPS controller and start running around in that tunnel right away. Um, again, a big benefit of using this is that you've got your lighting, you've got your physics, you've got uh, anything you want right away is just going to work in a, at least a basic way. Was there another question? Yeah. Yep. I was wondering if you can actually use ProBuilder for animating with vertexes mm -hmm. and things like that. Yep. Yeah, it's, uh, you can use it for anything. It just creates this basically the same mesh as if you imported from any other tool. So if you want to animate it, if you want to script it and use it for, uh, I've made a, an entire demo game that had characters all built out of ProBuilder and weapons and pickups and all that. So, yep. Mm -hmm. Along that same line, real quick, also, of course, any materials, sh shaders, yada, yada, everything's going to work. There's no weird uh, restrictions on you. So, cool. OK, if I continue through a bit, we're good. Oh, yep. Yeah, the, the question was, how would you animate it? And that would be just the way you'd animate anything else in Unity. I'm not a real big animator, sorry. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so you have your object. And then you just um, add an animation clip to it or use Mechanum uh, to blend things together. Like moving an object, because I know that mm -hmm. when I played with uh, probably other before, like if I have an object that I put in the game, I just have like move object to here to here. It would not move unless I set up something that's called set up a mover, I think it is. 
oh, okay, that's, yeah, that's been deprecated, but yeah, it's important. Um, if you have an object, just generally in Unity, um, we used to have the default to be static. It may still be, actually. So if something is static in Unity, if you're a first-time user and wondering why all your ProBuilder objects aren't moving, they aren't animating, there's a little static checkbox. So this up here, this little checkbox, which just means like any other Unity object, standard thing, it's static, so it can be batched, it's better for performance, yada, yada, but it won't move in game, it won't do things. It's like the word sounds, static. So make sure you turn that off if you need to. Before you will set up, so you will set it up as static all the time, right? Yeah, it was just by default, but you can always turn it off. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I no longer have to worry about that as much. Cool, okay. So I have my, uh, my little shape here, and I want to turn it into, into that promised, amazing um, interior cave space. So I've got it here, I'll just flip the normals and start working on it. And as the original, or one of the original question was, questions was, what do I want to do about this gigantic, multi-sided polygon? Uh, so what happens here is if I start moving some points around, I get this really weird skewing going on up here. Uh, you can see it in the texture pretty well. I'll turn off the ProGrid's visual so you can see a bit better. So if I were to start editing this, I quickly get some weird stuff where ProBuilder is taking, just like a regular mesh editor, uh, that entire face and saying, all right, I'm going to have to smooth across these crazy normals, and I've made a bit of an extreme case here. But it doesn't really know what to do, and it's, of course, throwing in triangles. If I change this to shaded wireframe in the black, you can see each of the, the lines for what's really there, of course. Every polygon is made up of tries. Uh, so it's just doing its best to figure it out. You can help it with that, and that's the way you'd, uh, you'd want to. The simplest way is to try to think of it in quads, if you can. Quads are generally a good way to go. So I'll turn off, go back to regular shaded. Uh, if I want to take, let's try to make a little side room over here. OK, so I want this area to be a separate room, and I want to uh, bring the ceiling up on it. But currently, if I try to do that, what happens is, I, again, I get that, that, weird, that weird effect there that's not very good. So I'll need to make that into a, a quad on that side, or at least separate a bit. So I'll grab these verts here and move them. And again, you can see I'm using ProGrid, so it just it snaps uh, with that off. You know, I'm just moving this and trying to eyeball it and get it just right, and I'm going to have a problem. But ProGrid is on, and I'm keeping it at one meter, so right, it's pretty easy. Uh, now I want to turn this area. Let's see if I can select it here. Just, I'm trying to point at my screen, uh, right across from here to here into a single face. So I've got these two vertices. I can select them. And just like I did with the edges, I can connect. So click on the connect vertices over there. I'm so used to looking at icons. Uh, it's hard for me to find the text. Or Alt-E. So it's the same shortcut as on edges. We try to keep it similar. Alt-E will connect two edges. It'll connect two vertices. It's always the same. And now what I've created is a singular face here and this one here. Or not really created, but separated them. So if I select this one, and I'm having trouble selecting because it's grabbing the floor, uh, let's go back and turn off Select Hidden. So what's happening here is you can't see this face. It's hidden, but it's there, of course. So you probably want to turn that off. And as you can see up here, there's a lot of selection options because one of the biggest problems in 3D is always selection. You know, it's a 2D or a 3D turned into a 2D screen, so you've got to deal with a lot of stuff. Um, we'll try to go through some of these, but they get a little bit complex. A big item to remember is the Select Hidden on and off, though. So now when I click, it'll just ignore anything hidden. So I can go right through and select it. And I can hold Shift and extrude that face up. And then maybe do something the same on the bottom down here so I can separate this out a little bit. So I'll just grab these, Alt-E to connect. And here I can move it down. Uh, maybe make it another lower room, start pulling this out, something like this. Or I think I wanna, want to build this out. All right. Mm -hmm. When you went to Mark, good quads are the triangles. Now, is that showing? Uh, when you went to wireframe mode, uh, the good quads turned into triangles. Now, is that just showing at render time what it's turning into, but yeah. they're still yeah. really actually real quads? Yep. When you, when you turn on Unity's uh, shaded wireframe mode, it'll just show all meshes in the scene view with their actual tries as they're going to be rendered in the game. So yeah, you don't have to worry about that. But data structure-wise, they're still quads. Yep, as long as you've made it a quad, yep. OK. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool. Yeah, Thanks. so what you see in ProBuilder is going to be the real mesh. So right now, I can see this as a face and this and so forth. Uh, if I want to, I can break this down to tries, either manually by setting that edge, or we actually have a, a tool that'll triangulate the faces. So once I do that, now I can see that it's separate. So in edge mode, now I actually see that edge there. Um, and then I think, oh, no, I don't actually want to do that, of course. So I select those two, and then I can click on Merge Faces. 
and it brings them down into a single. Uh, or I could get real destructive and you know merge all of these down into a single face or something. So you know you can do it, and it's like oh that's not too bad yet. But once you start editing that, it's a problem. So we try not to you know handhold people too much because then um, you do actions and you wonder why is this not doing what I actually expected, um, which can lead to problems or not really problems, but uh, results that are bad. But we don't want to we don't want to restrict you guys, so so we let you do things like that. Um, but but maybe don't. Cool. So we've got we've got some pretty simple geometry here. I think we can go ahead and actually uh, make a way for you to get to get into into this item, all right, or into this cave. So I've put a face across the front. I can't get in. This this tunnel isn't doing much good. I better go ahead and open it up. So I think with this face selected here, I'll just use a, an extrude and pull this uh, inset it. But first, well, let's look at it doing it the wrong way. So if I do this, I'm going to have a bit of a problem because that's at sort of a weird angle, but my door is at a different angle. So again, I'm just prototyping. I just want some nice, simple 90-degree corners. Later on, I can get this more fancy. Uh, what I'm going to do is add just one extra edge here. And again, some of you might be thinking, oh no, I just made that end gone even worse. But you don't have to worry about it yet. You can always go in and, and edit that up later if you really feel like it. Uh, then I'll just move this around and kind of match it up to the edge there so it fits better. Uh, now it's a bit simpler if I want to, again, just keep adding a few more doing some dirty polygon work, but just making it fit pretty well. Oop, that was at a 0.5 meter grid, so I'm going to have to drop down. And if you're having trouble getting something to match up just right, uh, one trick is to turn on the grid and then set it to either uh, oop, turn on the visuals. And you can view it in an X, a Y, Z, or even a full 3D mode if you want to have a 3D. Oops, I didn't actually click it. A 3D grid uh, generally just kind of annoys me. But you can do it if it helps you see things. I keep it in Y. Uh, and turn it off when I don't need it with the little uh, eye icon there. All right, so I need one more, one more cut on the bottom here just to match that bottom. And then I can delete this, and we, we can get in and out here. Uh, just to go back and do this one other way, I want to show a way that I see a lot of people do pretty often that leads to uh, unhappy forum questions. And maybe I can uh, get around that here. So I have this, and one thing you might think is, oh, I can just hold Shift and do a little extrude on one axis and delete it, and I'm pretty much there all the way. The problem is, of course, uh, Unity only has, or currently, um, you can extrude on one axis or all. So what happened when I did one is I actually have, uh, let's see if I pull this in, all these other invisible faces created. Let me try and show this best. So if I select this vert here and pull it over, turn off the grid, there's this sort of super stretched crazy face on all the sides now. So if you do that a whole bunch of times, don't realize you're doing it, you're going to have a problem. Just kind of be aware that it's happening. Uh, and if you do, you'd have to then reweld some verts. Or better yet, just Control-Z a few times and do that manually. Uh, all right. Again, quick little tangent. Most of you guys are probably already super aware of that. Let's just set this up once more. OK, so we can now get in. That's great. Uh, we have a problem, I guess, in that if I come running off this, I'm going to fall to the ground. And I probably want a stairway or a ramp there. So quick and easy, I can hit Control-K, create a cube. If you hold V, it'll snap. That's just a nice Unity thing. So you can grab from a corner and, and snap things around. And I'll make this fit up to that. And I'll make a little ramp here so we can get in. Maybe it should be a little bit longer. There we go. Once again, if I take this edge and pull it down to make a ramp, I've actually stuck two verts together and done kind of a bad thing. That's OK. I know they're there. I can just grab these and hit Alt-C to collapse the verts or click on it in the, uh, in the menu, kind of like um, remove duplicates, I think, in, in some other tools. Not sure what names I can use specifically. <laughs> uh, who knows? Another option is just to select them originally and hit Alt-C right away and just collapse and then move them. This has a nice option, too, where if you go to its options under, the, under that, we're at 440. OK, so we got 20 minutes left. Uh, you've got the option to collapse the first, which can be nice. So you turn that on, it becomes your default. Now if I select this vertex first and then any amount of others, they're going to collapse down to, oops, down to that point that I selected first. Uh, of course, you don't want to actually select that one. That would be very bad. There we go. So that works much better. So now if you have a point that you want it to go directly to, that works for you. Uh, there's also weld vertices, split them, all sorts of things if you're used to more tools. Oop, sorry, one back there. I wasn't looking. Do we have a mic? 
or yo. <laughs> See, um, what's the difference between collapsing verts and welding verts? Uh, I see in the toolbar because uh, they mm -hmm. seem like to be the same thing, but I'm not sure if ProBuilder makes them different. Sure. Yeah. If I let's see, undo this. So maybe I was just eyeballing this without having ProGrids on, and I just kind of pulled this down hereabouts. But I wanted to bring those together just by doing it all at once. So weld verts would work in that case. And what's going to happen is it picks within a threshold right now set to some crazy number, but let's say 0.25 meters. Uh, now that's my default, so I don't have to change it again. And when I hit weld, it's going to grab any verts that are within that distance and kind of smush them down, uh, versus collapse would just take all of those and put them into a single point. So, so weld is great if you have um, maybe like uh, two hallways or something that have come together, and you don't want all of that to, of course, smush down into a single like, like, a, like a black hole. Um, you just want them to weld together. So it's called weld, I guess. Uh, does that help? I think. Yeah, yeah, it does. Thank you. Okay, cool, cool. All right, so, oops, let's weld those. And this should be set. Turn back on my grid and click push to grid to make sure. Yep, so they were a little bit up. And another reason for ProGrids right there is sometimes it's really hard to tell if things that you have are, you know, correctly matching. So right here, I'd have to really get in here and, and check and see if that's properly on the ground. Now, the reason being, if you have light you're baking in, or if there's maybe, that would be a nasty physics problem where your character might actually catch on that lip on the edge there and not be able to go up and you can't figure out why, snapping things to a grid makes sure everything comes together real nice and easy. It just saves you some trouble later on. Nope. Cool, so that's a ramp. Ramps are fun but not very exciting. We should instead make a stairway maybe. So control shift K, Oop. created the last thing I had. That's, in this case, not great, that's okay. Uh, we can quickly change that to a stair. So now this is going to be here. And again, using this little preview that's blue, I can hold V and snap the points so it's easier to work. And I know the height for this, actually, by looking at the base texture. And I know my grids are at 0.5, so this is 1.5 high. So I'll just go ahead and set the height to 1.5. Oops, if I could type correctly. There we go. And set that up. Uh, question? It's all right. It's good. So that uh, the prototype texture is that the default, or did you set that yourself? It's just a default in Pro Builder, okay. which you can also change in the preferences among a hundred other things. So yep, it kind of helps when you're just building basic stuff. So yeah, you could uh, mess with all those various settings. I want to move around a little, move along a little quicker right now. Um, There's another so question in the back. Do you want to wait? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Well, the last part is uh, the polybrush stuff, so we're we're on good time. Yeah, um, this there, is the collision is going to be the same as the ramp, or will it be completely squared off? By default, as you can see there, it's just a mesh collider so that when you create it, it works. And then if you wanted to use the ramp as, a, as the mesh, it's something you would create that ramp separately. Uh, just like if you had imported a high poly object from Blender or Maya or something, and you want a really uh, simpler mesh, you'd build it separately. What you could also do with this, though, is just change it to convex. And the math kind of just works out, hooray, because uh, it's just going to you know, take all those stair chunks and remove them. And that'll make it more efficient, better. Yep. Uh, in regards to the um, faces that are like connected to each other that are underneath and you can't really see them, mm -hmm. uh, would it be simpler to just delete those? Uh, or do they just delete on their own? Uh, you have the options. You're talking about like down here underneath and on the sides or the back, maybe? Yep, so you can, when I was creating that in the options, if I go back to the stair shape, where'd it go? Uh, you have some options to build the sides or not if you want to make it a little more, uh, if you make it easier so you don't have to delete them yourself. And then, yeah, just for performance reasons, I guess, you don't want to have to, to bake lighting for those chunks, it's probably best to delete them so you're not wasting texture space or anything on that, or polys, et cetera. Mm -hmm. A big thing, though, when you're, when you're working with this is try not to worry too much about stuff, like making it super optimized. Um, and a whole question is, sorry, just towards the end. I know there's one or two more right now. I just want to get through the polybro section real quick, and then, uh, then we, should be, we should be pretty good. Cool, so this doesn't look quite as awesome and amazing <laughs> as the other one was, because obviously it was, uh, but we'll move along. So I have this cave, and OK, cool. My, uh, my prototype is kind of working out, but I really want to see it a bit more organic. So the first thing I need to do is start adding some more uh, detail to it. So I can add some extra loops, things like that, real quick. I actually select multiple edges and, and just do that a bit more easily. Uh, or I can use the subdivide. So it's not a real subdivide. It's more of a, a technically a smart connect. So as I 
click it, it's just going to grab all edges and connect them in the center. So now I have a lot more verts here. And I don't want to actually work on this by hand. That would be crazy if I'm going to take this and say, OK, I want this to be right about there or something. That's, that's madness. So we have Polybrush. So let's open that up. All right, so Polybrush lets you, as we saw in the fantastic video, sculpt, smooth, texture blend, paint on textures, scatter objects, lots of fun things. In this case, we're going to use it just to quickly paint this out a bit. So once you have it turned on, you have a, a row across the top that gives you the basic modes, kind of like Pro Builder. So the first one is just push inverts around. And you can hold Control and scroll that little brush up larger. Shift is going to change the interior di diameter. And Shift Control will change the strength. So we're trying to make it pretty easy if you not have to work with the, uh, the UI too much. Get this sort of out of the way here. Get a smaller brush. And then we can go through and start just sort of painting this up. So that's not going real fast. It's not doing much. I'll hold Control Shift, bring my strength up, maybe even the size. And then if I hold Control, I can do an opposite. So I actually want to push these out a bit. And I'm going to start kind of uh, building this out to be again, just a bit more organic or something. Build this shape out. Maybe even a better option would be if I switch this to smoothing mode. And I'll start smoothing these. So I can just take these sharp edges and real quickly turn this into something that looks more like an actual tunnel. Down towards the end, I have these corners that I actually want to stay exactly in that point. So if I start smoothing this, those corners could go all over the place. But I want them to stay there. So I can make sure I have checked on or, or checked here, ignore open edges. If I turn that off, uh, just to demonstrate, so now they're going to move all over the place, which actually looks all right. But I'm going to start to get some leaks, and I want to fix it. So I'll undo. And then maybe I'll just work on that later, sort of manually move those points around might be better. And now with that turned on, so it's going to ignore those edges. It's just going to leave those right there. So if I look at this over on the side, nothing's going to move. So you won't get any mesh leaks, any problems like that. Uh, so I can go through and just keep painting this and kind of make something that looks, again, more similar to a, to a cave or a tunnel. And well, we're at 447, so maybe we'll move to some questions and I'll demo a bit more as we go. We got uh, not all the way through that, but I think it was pretty much everything. Uh, I just made things a little fancier than the other one. Um, where was that first question we missed? Uh, you were trying to edit the stairs, and it was kind of difficult. Can you isolate objects uh, to edit them individually? Uh, isolating, you can't yet, except with the new nested prefabs, which are super awesome. You could make it a prefab, and then just you uh, forget. I think double click in the hierarchy, and it goes into a pre into an isolated option. Uh, something else we're also working on as part of the awesome new world building team, which these guys back here, Mark Andre and Carl Henkel, um, we're working on uh, some scene viz tools, so you can do stuff like that, which is very exciting. Yep. Uh, what else do we have? Any other questions here? Yep. And then there. Uh, OK, sorry, it's going. <laughs> uh, one of my questions was if you can explain why N-Gons are terrible and if the, <laughs> um, the texture that you have on there currently, um, like when it warped, was that like showing the UV warp? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, N-Gons are bad because as you start um, trying to move them around, as I was kind of showing before, Everything is technically made out of tries. So an engon is actually hiding from you what's really there. A quad is also hiding it. But as long as you're moving it in, in basic ways that like most of this is, you know, when we extrude and, and move, say, this, um, this is a good example, this up and down. So there's actually you know, a, a try going from this corner down to here, or maybe it could be the other way. It doesn't actually matter in this case. That's going to look OK. But if I were to make this an engon by adding in say this right here. Now when I select just one corner and move it up, you get that you know, weirdness. And that's because there's actually, uh, I'll turn back on that wireframe, there's actually that try going across there. Because everything has to be tries, you know, three points to define a plane. Uh, so n-guns aren't necessarily like a performance issue or something. It's just that you're going to get weird modeling issues eventually, um, unless you're using them on purpose. So just you know, be aware of it, that's all. Mm -hmm. Was there a second half to that I missed? Uh, oh, the textures. Yeah. Yeah, so when the texture is warping, that's just uh, ProBuilder automatically does UV unwrapping on everything. It's just auto UVs. And we really didn't have time to get into that on this, uh, on this talk, so I didn't do it at all. But as you can see, it kind of takes, takes care of it for you automatically. There's nothing fancy happening here with a shader or anything. If these were a regular brick texture or something, it'd be exactly the same. But it just tiles those everywhere. Uh, and sometimes you, know, you have a weird shape. It just can't really do it perfectly. Yep. Uh, 
Yep, one more. I was actually going to ask about the UV tools. Ah, OK. Uh, I can get into them real quick. We have 10 minutes, unless how many more questions do we have? I can. We'll keep running through questions, and I'll get to those if we have time, or after, of course. Yep. Back here? Yep. Sorry to, to tell. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, actually, we there's a there's a like debug a tool or something, or right? They'll tell you that. Not officially, really. Why do I? I'm off on this. Yeah, uh, not officially, no. But yeah, it'd be it'd be great. Mm -hmm. We're good. Cool. Okay, I'll jump into some of the texturing stuff real quick. We've got you know nine minutes or so. Uh, all right. So let's see, what could we texture on here? Uh, let's just go with something like this, this wall in the back. I'll turn back off the shaded and turn off polybrush. Cool, so back here I want this to be something different. Uh, if I open up the UV editor, we've got a UV editor of sorts. So if you're used to this in other 3D modeling tools, it's very similar. Uh, by default, everything is on auto. So what this means is if I turn on, actually it'll work both ways, but for the simplest option, Turn on these in-scene handles via this toggle. Now I can go in the scene and just move this around. Oops, that's backwards right now. Ignore it. <laughs> I've done something bad to it. And you can rotate it. Ah, this is what I get. This is an experimental build right now. Sorry, guys. So anyway, you get the idea. Uh, maybe I'll pick something that, that, that'll work so you can see it a bit better. Let's see. Let's create a quick cube. This will work better. So if I have an object and I want to do some actual work on this. All right, turn those scene handles back on. And there, hooray, it's very exciting. So I can uh, rotate it and then scale it or move it. So this is just modifying the UVs. You can see them on the right-hand side over here. You can, of course, do exact edits if you want to set a very specific uh, offsets or rotation, tiling, any of those. Um, you can do it that way. But it's a lot of times when you're prototyping simpler, just do it in the scene. And again, we're trying to keep you guys from having to actually use fancy toolbar stuff. You're just doing the standard uh, in-scene editing, which is much, much simpler than, than having to learn something else. If you want to get more complex, maybe this object, let's take it and kind of, oops, turn off those in-scene and do some, some stuff here. Let's say I've made a, some sort of pipe shape, or it might be an arch or something. And I want a UV across this, but it's not really going to work for UV or auto UVs, because it needs to go across this, this shape here. So I can set what I want to be the perfect UVs. Maybe in the bottom, it's already looking pretty good. And then hold Control and click, and it just automatically builds it up. So if I'm looking over here, yeah, it's a crowd pleaser. <laughs> uh, so again, with, let's see, I'll start from here. You can see it on the right there. It's, it's building up the UVs in the background. You don't have to worry about this stuff yourself. So I'm clicking, and it's just building it up automatically. So maybe from here, I want to go to the side. And it puts it together for you. So that's, that's a pretty great way of doing it. It uh, doesn't work for everything. It's good for hard surface stuff, but it, it'll really take care of that pretty nicely and easily. Uh, if you have something that is maybe more organic, let's maybe scale this down and make sort of a little shape here. I should turn off Pro Grids. We don't need that. So this, if I were to use that trick on it, I'm going to get something that's kind of weird, right? It's, uh, let's grab these. So none of these edges are coming together. I could try to weld up those edges, you know, just go in here and just like in the geometry mode, oops, grab something extra. Uh, anyway, I could, I could just collapse these down. But a better way is just to select these and use a quick planar projection, and then it's done for you. Uh, so there's not a lot in the UV tools, but there's just the basics to get you moving. And then if you have something even more complex, I think I have a good example in here. Let's see, texturing advance, there we go. I'll save it because it's pretty cool. Stuff's a good. <laughs> You've probably seen from my hierarchy already. I love to name things very well. <laughs> Lots of those. Lots of those. Cool. So we have this little scene that I created for a, actually a tutorial video online. You guys should totally watch it if you're interested in, in learning the UV work. So I have this item here. And I had to do some more fancy unwrapping with it because I wanted to make sure that uh, this you know, sort of interior texture and this amazing magical arch went all the way around and the sides worked out. So in the UV editor, I've built it up. And then what I did is use the, the um, render template option. Again, something you might be used to if you use other 3D tools. You can save this out as a PNG and then pop it into Photoshop, paint over top of it, and bring it back in. 
and turn on the texture view. And depending on what you have selected, it'll show it. There we go. And then match it up a bit more if you need to. So that's for if you're doing hand painted textures, you can totally do that. Um, with a few minutes left, that's a good time for a final talk about that specifically. Yes, you can take anything you're building in Pro Builder as far as you want, but it's usually best to think of it as a prototyping tool. And then you can export to OBJ, now FBX. Uh, you could even do STL and some fun things. Uh, I've done a lot of 3D prints using Pro Builder, which is great. It's very fun to use. So take it as far as you want. We ha we've had some games like you know Strafe uh, built everything using entirely Pro Builder, or, or pretty much anyway. Uh, Gladiobots used it for all their, their even characters in game. And then others like Tenertia just originally built their shapes out of Pro Builder and then just uh, exported that to, I, I forget what other tool they were using, but it became just a nice base they could then build the, build the high mesh over. And then they kept the original as their really nice, uh, efficient collision volumes. So it worked out great. You never are uh, wasting any time on it. Cool, so we got a few more minutes left. Um, what other questions do we have or anything else I should demo? One more here. Uh, the uh, subdivide is cool, but do you have anything closer to Catmull Clark subdivision, even if it's not fully specifiable? Just smoothing it, uh, you know, uh, you know nothing. I mean? like rounding out the edges. Yeah, nothing fancy like that. We do have smoothing control, which I totally forgot to show off. Um, oof, I'll do a real quick demo of that because people should see it. Uh, so okay, let me create something. <laughs> There's my giant cube again. Okay, that's what I get for creating that. Control K. I'll create a create a cube here uh, and, and show something off. So normally we have these hard edges. And I want to add some, some detail to this and also keep it maybe one side. I want to have a little bit of a curve across it. So this is looking really chunky right now. Um, but I can make it look better. Let me just add a few more here manually. So yes, it would be nice if there was some sort of automated way to do that. Cool. So I have this. And you can see the facets on the edge if I just select each of these. Or I could use the Grow Selection tool to do it instantly. Uh, then I can open up the smoothing panel. And if you're used to max, it's pretty much the same to so just set a smoothing group, and now it's smoothed over. So it's a great way if you want to create something that uh, has very few polys, but you want it to still look kind of smoothed. Obviously, from you know, uh, a different angle, you're going to see all those. But that's a pretty common trick used to cheat your way through low poly and make it look nice. Uh, yep, yep. And those will save over, or they should, when you export it. Uh, anything else? Good? One? Yep. More of a soft question, not a technical question. Like, for historical purposes, like, what was the impetus for Pro Builder being built as a tool at the beginning? Cool. I can I can put three minutes into that for sure. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, so I started out using um, a lot of different engines in school and such, and then as an artist, I realized this is really complex. I found Unity. It's like, hooray! This is amazing. Uh, I can build things and I can make them work. And I wanted to create an FPS game. And I was like, OK, this is cool. I'm going to make you know, a great retro FPS game like everybody else thought at the time, I think. Uh, this was six years ago or so. Uh, and the first thing I looked for was, how do I create some meshes? I just want to make a hallway. I want to draw some things like what we just did today. I wanted to throw that, throw that together. It didn't exist. Uh, so I started learning JavaScript. And the original version was built in JavaScript. And it was terrible, but it worked. And I was very happy. Uh, and then very quickly, Carl Henkel joined. So hooray, we got a much better tool. Uh, and uh, things happen from there. So yeah, the, the whole idea was just to have this real quick prototyping tools in the engine uh, without having to go back and forth, import and export files, and go through all that. Yep. Yep. Uh, yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. So when you have something selected, you can go under the tools and then Pro Builder and down to export. You got a few options there. And if you have the FBX uh, tools also from Unity, uh, then you can do FBX as well. So yeah, that's the big idea. It's nothing you create is wasted. You're building it here as a prototype. You can always export it, keep using it, uh, just keep it in here as a collision or something. Um, and in my last minute, I totally forgot to show you guys my favorite tool in this, actually, which is uh, using oops the, the colors. Colors are great. So if you're building something and you want to set uh, like, like red base, blue base, all that fun stuff, you can open up the color palette and just set colors on things. So. So that's fun. Uh, this is that's a terrible example. Uh, the floor here that is actually just set to green. This is really cool if you are building something and you want to, oh, I'm sorry, I'll get to you in one second. Um, add a little bit of texture, or, or I mean color, or, or grunge to a corner, or some extra lighting. You could even do all your lighting hand painted via that, just because it'll overlay uh, if you're using a, a shader that allows it. 
which our default one does. So that's super fun. Uh, yep, back there. Uh, do, when you export the object or FBX out, uh, will you actually have the unwrap with it, or do you have to re-unwrap it, and say, if I wanted to add like a, a specialized texture? Everything stays. Yep. So you won't have to do any extra work. It'll just stay as is. Mm -hmm. Yep. Does it, uh, does it pick up a world coordinates from the scene, or it exports in object space? Uh, is that an option we have, or? OK, yeah, it's an option. Mm -hmm. Um, importing. Can you, so let's say I take that, I'll, I'll put it, you know, export it, do whatever I'm going to do in another package and bring it back in. Is there a way so um, when I bring that in, I can, you know, like, highlight that and just say replace that object? Um, the FBX tools have a way to, to do some of this. Uh, you can also use, we have a ProBuilderize, very also well-named tool that'll take an imported mesh and convert it to a ProBuilder mesh uh, so you can edit it in the scene as well. Is that what you meant, or something a little different? No, like, it, like if I bring, if I have that object, I take it out, take it to my, my, uh, my 3DS code, whatever tool, tweak it, make it what I want it, add all the detail, whatever. I want to put it back in the scene exactly. OK. I want to put it back in the scene exactly where that is, because it's you know prototyping going into, the, into production. Yeah. Can I mm -hmm. just say? replace this object with the new one. Yep, that's something you'd want to do with the, the new FBX exporter tools. They're, they're awesome. There's a whole video on that. Um, I'm not super well versed on it, but yeah, it kind of does it. So we're at 501. You guys can get headed out if you want. I'm not sure what the setup is here for time, but I'm happy to stay around and answer. Is that OK? I can just stand up here and keep talking? Or actually, I'll take the mic off so I can talk to people better without blasting everyone. Yeah, OK, cool. All right, thanks, everybody, very, very much.